In the name of Jesus the Christ, I welcome you to worship at University Christian Church. My name is Shannon Moore. I'm one of the ministers on staff here, and I am so glad that you have decided to worship with us this morning. For those of you who are here in the sanctuary, thank you for making the effort to get here through traffic and heat to be here. And for those of you who are worshiping with us online, thank you for taking the time out of your day to worship with us now uh, in this exact moment or at some point in the future if you're watching this at a later time. I hope that you had a moment to pick up a worship bulletin as you came in. There are some important things happening in the life of our community, but one that I'd like to really highlight, it's on page seven. Um, we have had an online directory for a long time uh, called Instant Church, Dir Church Directory, and that thing is about to go away at the end of the month. So if that is how you keep up with people, I would encourage you to download our UCC app and all of that directory information is on that app along with a lot of other information, uh, videos, upcoming events, you can give, you can submit prayer requests and you can enter your attendance. So you could do that right now if you'd like, or if you're old fashioned and you would like to just fill out a card, there are some of those in the pews in front of you, just jot your name down. Especially if you're here with us for the first time, we would love to have an email address or a telephone number that we could get in contact with you. On that same card or on the app, you can submit prayer concerns. Our clergy gather each week and we pray for those concerns that are submitted every Sunday. As we are in this space, preparing ourselves to lift our voices in song, join our hearts together in prayer, hear the word proclaimed, and share a meal at Christ's table, let us be in a spirit of worship. I invite you to stand as you are able as we sing our processional hymn. It is number six. Sing praise to God who reigns above. Let us stand and sing together.
join me in our call to worship printed in your worship bulletin. For those of you worshiping with us at home, the words will appear on your screen. We approach the God of grace and glory who has called us to worship this day. We arrive from the chaos of our world into the clarity of God's presence. We leave the struggles of our lives to embrace the power of God's love. May this hour bring us courage and a time to strengthen our faith. the lovely parts of being in a community of faith together is to share in the joys and concerns of our community. There are a couple that we would like to say today. They are also printed on page seven of your bulletin. Today we celebrate with Julie and Jeff Swain in the birth of a grandson, John Ellsworth, born on August 7th. Parents are Anna and Andy Swain. We also hold close to our hearts today, Brayson Melton and his family following the death of his father, Chris Melton, on August 4th in North Carolina. May God hold all of these joys and concerns. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Holy One, we come to you this day and give you thanks that this is the day that you have made. We take a moment in the midst of this morning to find peace and solace in you. Calm our worried minds and anxious hearts. Help us find space in this place and in our hearts to find you and to locate ourselves in your presence. Holy One, we come to you this day in many different places, some grieving, some in joy, and some in despair. Despite all that the world and just living life throws our way, you remind us of your overarching story that swaddles us in comfort and hope. You call to us in our despair and fatigue and whisper to us that we are loved and cherished. Then you pull us out of ourselves so that we can become your loving and graceful presence even in this chaotic world, especially in this chaotic world. As we breathe in your peace that settles in our bones, we become aware of the world around us. There is much hurt, much anger, much confusion, and sometimes we feel powerless to address it all. We pray that you open our eyes, that we might open a door of hope an awareness of the people in our lives who are hungry for healing and wholeness, that we might be open to the restlessness of our own hearts, of who you are and who we are called to be. Sing to us in our hearts and let it reverberate through our souls so that we might feel a hint of your never-ending love for all that we are. Renewed by that love, grant us courage, wisdom, and grace to live in this time knowing that we are never alone. We pray and hold all of these things as we pray the prayer your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Glad that you were with us. I also want to say a special welcome uh, to all of our TCU students that are joining us this morning. I know that a new semester, a new school year uh, starts tomorrow. Um, and I want you to know, we want you to know uh, that you will be in our prayers. Uh, UCC started 150 years ago as the university church created specifically for faculty, students, and staff. And so that has always been part of our DNA. And so I hope and pray that you will find this to be a place that is welcoming, uh, that is supportive, that is uh, nurturing to you during your time uh, that you're here at school, that this might be a church home away from home for you. Uh, I also want to take a moment to invite you uh, to a lunch that's happening immediately following the service in our college lounge. Uh, it's sort of a college kickoff lunch. Uh, and I would love to have you uh, join our college ministry staff. The easiest way to get to the college lounge is to go right out these doors, make a right, and down at the end of the quarter, uh, you'll see some folks uh, there that will welcome you in and give you something good to eat. So we are in the midst of a series uh, that we are looking at how in our busy Western culture that we live under the directorate of time. And all of that seems to lead to a, an unnecessarily busy schedule, an unnecessary sense of hurry, causing for what many of us experience as hurry sickness. It's an impact, uh, it's, a, it's a disease that impacts us physically, but also spiritually as well. And so in this series, we are looking at a different way, what I like to refer to as a better way, and that is quite simply the patient way of Jesus. We are looking at some of the relational rhythms that we find ourselves in to create space in the midst of this busy world. Uh, you know, in John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and life to the fullest. But unfortunately, I think many of us have understood, misunderstood what he meant by that. It didn't mean to pack all that you can into a busy schedule. That's not what it means to have a full life. And so what we are looking at is a way that we can align our passions and our priorities as we create our schedule and our pace of life. So the text that we're looking at this morning is a very well-known, much-beloved story uh, that's found in Luke's Gospel, where we pick up the story. Jesus is on his way from Jerusalem to the nearby village of Bethany, where he stops uh, to visit his friends, Mary, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. Now, John's Gospel tells us quite specifically that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And one biblical commentator that I read this last week says that, that Mary and Martha may have been the most important and prominent women in Jesus' life other than his own mother. So these are trusted friends. These are people that he can be honest with. He can speak the truth in love and say what needs to be said. And that's what he does in this story. So I invite you to listen now to Luke chapter 10. The scripture this morning comes from Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 38 through 42. Here begins the reading. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Here ends the reading, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John Ortberg is a Presbyterian pastor and a writer. He serves a church in Northern California, not far from where I came from. Uh, now, I don't like the phrase megachurch, but I suppose this would count as one of those. His first position to head a big church like that was at Willow Creek Church in Chicago. 
And not long after he started that role, back in the 90s, he called a friend, a wise friend, a mentor in ministry, a guy by the name of Dallas Willard, and asked for some spiritual direction. They talked for a moment about the pace of life in this present condition. Uh, he talked about uh, the rhythms of his family life. He talked about the condition of his heart. And finally, he got to the question that he wanted to ask. And he says, he says, Dallas, what do I need to do in the midst of this frenzied life? What do I need to do to be spiritually healthy? And there was a long pause. Ortberg says that whenever Dallas speaks, there are lots of long pauses. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Another long pause. Ortberg says, okay, good, got it, wrote that down, that's a good one. <laughs> what else, what's next? What else you got for me? This was a long distance call back in the 90s, you had to pay per minute. He had a lot going on, he wanted to cram as many pieces of spiritual wisdom into his life. What else? Another long pause. There is nothing else. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our world today. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. I want you to imagine that someone wrote you a prescription tore it off the pad with the warning that your life depended on what was on that piece of paper. And now I want you to consider that perhaps your life does depend on it. it depends on your ability to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Dr. Meyer Friedman was a cardiologist way back in the 50s. It was way back in the 50s that he coined the phrase hurry sickness. And he pointed out that type A people, busy, fast moving people, people that are constantly in a hurry are more prone to heart attacks, live with more stress, more anxiety. Psychologists and mental health professionals are now talking about this hurry sickness as an epidemic in our modern world. They have labeled it now as a disease. It affects us physically and emotionally, and I would argue that it impacts us spiritually as well. As Willard said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. It can destroy our souls. It can keep us from living well, from living emotionally healthy and spiritually rich lives. You know, there's something that I think that we need to acknowledge and maybe even admit, and that is that deep down, I think we thrive on this pace of life. We complain about how busy we are, about all that needs to be done. We, we complain about the speed at which we move, but I think that there's a part, there's a part of us that likes it. Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, wrote a letter not too long ago to all of the shareholders, to everyone who owns stock in Amazon, celebrating the pace of life and the living in this world. He said this, he said, speed matters in business. Plus, he said, a high velocity decision-making environment, well, it's just more fun, too. Speed. A high-velocity way of life is paramount to him, to business, and in our culture. But I would argue that it is addictive and that we like it. 
Like Bezos says, it's just, it's more fun. It may be hurting us. It may be causing us great damage. But there's a part of us that really likes it. It may be paramount to business. But it isn't paramount to the way of Jesus. Now, I'm not a psychologist, and so my grasp, my understanding of addiction is cursory at best. But from what I understand about addiction, from what I've read, that there is this basic neurological dopamine thing. And you do this thing, whatever it may be, maybe it's take drugs, maybe it's drink too much, maybe you're constantly on your phone, maybe you're doom scrolling, as my kids like to refer to it. Maybe you're living a life filled with hurry, and every time we find ourselves in that moment, we, there's this instant dopamine release in your body, in your brain, and it just feels good. It's, it's a little hit. But most of the experts that I've read say that addiction is way deeper than just some neurological draw towards a substance, towards a habit, towards an activity, maybe a, a relationship. That it's more often than not, it's, it's an emotional narcotic, even if it's not a drug. It is, in layman's language, an attempt to run from the pain. Most of us who have some sort of an addiction, whether it be substance or alcohol or social media, maybe it's work, maybe it's shopping, whatever it is, whatever it is, most of the time, it's an attempt to self-medicate a deeper pain, a deeper struggle. Ortberg, who I spoke of at the beginning, says that hurry is not a sign of a disordered schedule. More often than not, it's a sign of a disordered heart. So I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, where, where is this hurry coming from? And you can say on a surface level, well, you know what? I just want to experience more in life. I want to get all that I can out of life. I want to get more done. I, I love running errands. But likely it's a much deeper issue. More often than not, we are running from some sort of pain. Scared that if we slow down and live life as it actually is, We'll have to experience every moment, not just the moments of deep goodness and beauty, but also all of its pain. We are running from life as it is in all of its complexities. Or, or maybe we're running to something. Promotions, purchases, experiences, stamps on our passport. Maybe it's running towards some sense of self-worth, of love, of acceptance. You know, many of us feel that we are only as good as our next sales commission, as our next quarterly report, that our lives are only as good as our next Instagram post. Some of us feel like our life is only as good as our next sermon that we preach. And we are constantly out of breath, chasing this ever-elusive wind. You know, part of the reason that it's so hard to slow down is because oftentimes we are rewarded, aren't we? We're rewarded in this hurried culture. In some circles, in some circles, when somebody asks you how you are, the best answer that you can give is, you know, I'm good. I'm busy, but I'm good. And we wear it like a badge of honor. In fact, we even, we even brag about how many hours we work, how many days off we miss, how, many, how much work we did that last week. Truth be told, I do it too. I do it myself. I love it. I love it when people tell me, you know what, Russ, I wanted to call you with this question, but I didn't want to bother you. I know how busy you are. And there's a part of me in that moment that's like, yes, I am busy. I'm busy because I'm important. And in that moment, the dopamine is released. But it lasts just a moment. And then in the moment after that, 
I come to realize that my value system is off kilter, that something is not right deep in my heart. Hurry isn't just a sign of a disordered schedule, it's a sign of a disordered heart. And it is not paramount in the way of Jesus. In the story that we heard just a minute ago, Martha is hurrying, she's rushing, she's trying to get stuff done. Distracted, Luke says. While Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, fully present, she was listening with her whole body. She was hanging on every word he said, one translation puts it. And Jesus tells Martha, oh, Martha, you're worried, you're distracted by so many things. Only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better way. What do I have to do to be spiritually healthy, he asked. You must ruthlessly, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Notice, notice that Willard didn't say, you need to find some time-saving tips. You need to, to make a few tweaks to your schedule in order to get things more done. He didn't say, you need to take a vacation and be gone for a couple of weeks and then jump back into the rat race in which you find yourself. No, he said, ruthlessly eliminate if you want to be spiritually healthy. That's strong language, isn't it? Ruthlessly eliminated, strong language that, that necessitates bold action. But I think in our cult of speed, what we talked about last week, that cult of speed is so subversive and it is so invisible that we have to so strongly resist it. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry if you want to be a spiritually healthy person. And I might argue, I might add, in order to be a person of love. Do, do you remember in Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, there in the 13th chapter, when he talks about, when he talks about what love is? And it begins a long list of what love is, the very first thing that he said. Do you remember what he said? Love is patient in order to be a person of love, we have to ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. I believe that's why Jesus never hurried. And if we are to follow Jesus, we have to eliminate hurry from our lives ruthlessly because by definition, we can't move faster than the person that we are following. Now church, we can do this. And I say that that way in part to convince myself. I can do this, but I can't do it alone and I don't think you can either. It's gonna take all of us. We can become more patient, we can become more loving, but we can't do it alone. And you may remember if you were here last week that I just invited you just, just to notice those times when you found yourself hurrying, rushing, feeling impatient and to consider how that might be impacting and affecting your walk with Jesus. Well, let me, let me confess for just a moment, a moment when I found it. The other night, my wife Kelly and I were watching TV, and I don't even remember what we were watching, but any time a commercial would come on, I would immediately, almost without thinking of it, pick up the remote control and try to fast forward through the commercials. Anybody else try to do that from time to time? And if I was all caught up and I couldn't fast forward through the commercials, I'd change the channel to see what I could watch to entertain myself during the two minutes when the commercials were on. As you can imagine, this was not particularly appreciated by my beautiful wife. And finally she says, will you just knock it off? And then she said this, what was your sermon about on Sunday? <laughs> oh, man. Tell me I'm not alone in this, that you found ways. Now, 
Let me tell you, I, I suspect that I'm not alone in this because on Tuesday, I got an email from one of you who said, you know, my ribs are sore because my wife kept elbowing me all the way through a service. <laughs> to which I said, this is a six week series, so you might want to slide down the pew. <laughs> or make your child sit between you, maybe, uh, whatever it takes. So over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about some practices, not just things, not just times when you notice, but things that you can do to help us move in that direction. And the first practice that I wanna introduce you to and to lift up before you is the practice of slowing. The practice of slowing. And it involves cultivating patience by deliberately choosing to place ourselves in positions in which we have to wait. Now, for some of you, I say that, and it feels like I've just released a bottle of spiders down your throat. It's just like, oh, I can't do that. That sounds awful. But maybe, maybe practice it like a, like a game. You may hate it at first, but give it a shot. So let me give you an example of a few of these practices of slowing in which we deliberately place ourselves in positions where we have to wait. For the next week, for the next two weeks, I want you to choose deliberately to drive in the slow lane on the freeway. Now, hear me when I say that does not mean drive slowly in the fast lane. That does not, no, that's not, helpful to anybody. People may not appreciate your new spiritual practice. And as I remind my kids every time they drive on the freeway, people here have guns, right? So just be careful. Move over. Instead of trying to pass people along the way, simply say a little prayer. Prayer about those people that are holding you up. I might suggest that you declare a fast from honking for the next few weeks to put your horn under a vow of silence. For the next week, I want you to eat your food slowly, to force yourself to, to be fully present, turn off the TV, put down your phone, be fully present in the moment, taste each bite, chew each bite 15 times. Here's one. Here's one that got quite the reaction at the last service. I want you, when you go to the grocery store this afternoon, to choose the longest line at the checkout. <laughs> now I know you're gonna be at Trader Joe's this afternoon. It's the day before TCU starts and everybody else is gonna be there. Here's a great opportunity for you to practice slowness. And if you want extra credit, and I know some of you do, the extra credit is to let someone else go in front of you in that line. I want you to go through one day without wearing a watch. I want you to think about ways and places that you can deliberately place yourself in positions where you have to wait. After the early service this morning, somebody met me at the back of the door and said, you know what I'm going to do this morning, Russ? I'm going to go to Starbucks and stand in line and not dial ahead and have it waiting for me. And then she added, like a caveman. As we practice these ways, I know, I know that we, we have to do things. We're de we deliberately slow ourselves out. And, and, and as we do it, I invite you to say a little prayer, just trusting God to enable us to get done what needs to be done. You know, oftentimes we worry that if we don't rush, if we're not in a hurry, that we'll just accomplish less. But in fact, researchers have found that there is simply no correlation between hurry and productivity. What we'll discover over the next several weeks is that we will survive without hurrying. And we might even thrive. In fact, as Walter Adams, who was the spiritual director for C.S. Lewis, once said, to walk with Jesus is to walk a slow, unhurried pace.
because hurry is the death of prayer, and it only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances it. In other words, very little can be done with hurry that can't be done better without it. It's true in our work. It's true in our lives with God. It's even true in our work for God. To live a spiritually healthy life, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Could it be that Willard was right? That an over-busy, digitally distracted, hurried life of speed is the greatest threat to our spiritual life today. I can't help but wonder if Jesus was saying, not just to Martha, but to our entire generation, you're worried, you're upset, you're distracted by so many things. But only one thing is needed. Friends, the need of this hour is to slow down spiritually, to unhurry, and to walk in the patient way of Jesus. The peace of the Lord be with you. Our hymn of response today is Take Time to Be Holy, which is number 572 in the red chalice hymnal in front of you. As we stand to sing together, I invite you to pass the peace with those around you.
be seated. A new school year is upon us and student ministry is, is just getting started. Last week we blessed backpacks and a new school year together as a church family. Today marks the first day of programming for our bridge and youth ministries, and our college kickoff lunch is being held today right after service, which marks the beginning of a new year for our college ministry. Yesterday in our college student leadership team training, we were reflecting on all of the new that unfolds before us in this season new schedules and new routines, new people and sometimes new schools. New can be scary and hard and exciting all at once. And the beautiful part is that there is a community here who can hold all of those parts and all of that newness and say, God is present in all of this and you are loved. Thank you for your generosity to UCC and its ministries so that this place can continue to be a spot where students and maybe even us, where we can be reminded that God loves us and is present no matter what. Let us receive this morning's offerings.
Let us pray. Almighty God, as we come before you with our offerings, we are reminded of our constant need for you in our lives. You are our provider, our sustainer, and our strength. May these gifts be a symbol of our dependence on you, acknowledging that all we have comes from your hand. Help us to rely on you more fully in every aspect of our lives, trusting in your unfailing love and care. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. One of the most wise and patient people I ever knew was a woman named Jean Chancellor, and she died about a month before her 105th birthday. At her memorial service, her son was telling a story about a time when they were driving together and he had a flat tire, and he was grumbling and cursing and aggravated and changing the tire, and Jean just sort of wandered off by herself, and when he finally got the tire changed, she indicated for him to go to where she was, and she said, look at this flower. Have you ever seen such a beautiful flower? If we hadn't had that flat tire, we would have never seen this flower. I think about that a lot, and it reminds me of Jesus reminding us to consider the lilies, to find the beauty in things, to pause, to stop, to appreciate the things that are right in front of us, the way that God speaks to us in simple things that are just all around us, like bread and juice. And so once again, we remember the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body. It is for you. When you eat this, remember me. In the same way, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink this, remember me. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for this precious gift of communion. As we partake of the bread and the cup, may we be filled with your love and grace, and may we be strengthened to go forth and share your light with the world. Use us for your purposes, and may this sacred meal empower us to live as your faithful disciples. Amen. In just a few moments, the ushers will come to you with these elements. Take the bread as it is passed, but hold on to the cup, and we will share the cup together as one family of faith once everyone has been served. Everyone is welcome. Let us come to the table.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of discipleship is number 489, Bless Now, O God, the Journey. Please stand as you are able as together we sing. So before I offer the benediction, there are a couple things that I want to point out and call your attention to on page seven. One, as I already mentioned, uh, immediately following the service down in the college lounge, we'll have our college ministry kickoff lunch. We would love to have uh, all of the students join us for that. It would be great, a uh, great way to introduce some of the ministries of UCC in the days ahead. And then secondly, you'll notice there that uh, my wife Kelly and I are going to be leaving a trip to Ireland in the spring. Uh, and immediately following the service in room 251, I think, which is right up these steps over here to the right, there's going to be a short information meeting for folks that are interested in learning more about the trip and how to get signed up and that sort of thing. I would love to have the opportunity to tell you about that trip. Now, finally, I will say this, that at the beginning of the summer, I made a resolution, and that is that I was not going to complain about the weather this summer. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it, so why am I going to complain about it? Let me just say, God is testing me this week. <laughs> So my hope and my prayer for you is that you will find moments of cool, fresh breezes and that you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt as you patiently walk through life that you are loved as you are. And as we go, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face continue to shine upon us and fill us with patience now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>